Skinwalkers by Kamen Rider Chrome. As legend goes, to become a skinwalker you must attain priesthood and then kill a member of your own family. Then, and only then, can you gain the powers to shapeshift. Then, and only then, are you a true skinwalker. According to local folklore, a man had done just that. An Indian priest had supposedly not only killed one, but five immediate members of his family. They never caught this man. He disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. When Jason and Alex set out for their camping trip, they knew all the old legends, and they laughed at the idea that a skinwalker would come to get them if they trespassed on the old Indian land. The same land that supposed murders had taken place. And why would they believe the legends? A man becoming a beast was probably the most ridiculous thing imaginable. Jason and Alex were brothers. They spent their entire lives together until Jason had gotten married. Then Jason moved away and started a family. But not Alex. Alex stayed in their hometown, tending to their parents, making an honest living off of the land, and tried to be a good person. And Alex had succeeded at this. He hadn't broken a commandment in years, and was well on his way, well, in his own mind, to heaven. Three years had passed between their last get-together, and three more might have passed if Alex didn't insist on a camping trip. But insist he did, and there they were. It was getting dark, and the two of them were laying out under the stars. They were deep in the woods, and had no GPS or maps. But they knew the path back from where they were. They had gone there as kids. Never know. Huh? Alex replied. He only caught bits and pieces sometimes. We can never let Dad know, Jason reiterated. Now what? That we stayed on this old Indian land past dark? We promised him as kids and I don't want to upset him now. He's getting pretty close to dead. And if we start an argument now, we might not resolve it in time for, you know. Just don't tell him or Ma, okay? Okay, no problem. They were both silent for a while until up creeped a small raccoon. Well, look at that, Alex called as he pointed towards the critter. It stared at them for several minutes, not moving, not attempting to flee when they motioned towards it. It stayed almost perfectly still, and then finally it left. Minutes later came a deer. Again the creature stayed and watched them, unwavering determination glared in its eyes. For two hours, the duo was kept awake as every animal they knew to live in the forest, and some they were almost sure didn't inhabit the area, came to gaze upon them. The final animal was a grey wolf. It slowly moved towards them, and when it was five feet away, it stopped. Don't move. Don't panic. It'll go. Jason assured Alex. The wolf slowly stood up onto its hind legs, and then its limbs began to contort and pop. Horror slid over Jason and Alex's faces as they saw the fur tear open, revealing light brown flesh underneath. Finally, they gazed upon what looked like a man with a wolf's head. The skull of the wolf split open like a melon, the fur sliding off of it the bone chipping and falling like a fragile eggshell, and in its place slowly grew out the head of a man. The man now stood before the paralyzed brothers. They couldn't seem to move. This is my land, said the man with an almost supernatural smile. Now, now, mister, I'm going to have to ask you to... Alex trailed off. Get the fuck away from us, 
Jason said as fiercely as he could. The man began to laugh, and as he continued to laugh, the pitch changed. It grew deeper from that of a man to that of a demon, and soon it sounded as if Satan himself was bellowing out at them. The man's skin grew black as coal and his eyes yellow like a cat's. His demonic laughter echoed throughout the forest as he drew closer and closer. The brothers being unarmed, they had no choice other than to flee. And that's what they did. They ran as fast as they could, except instead of out to their cars, they were cornered into running deeper into the woods. For hours they seemed to play cat and mouse. Several times animals they passed would burst open into a grotesque manner revealing the deranged man, but they continued to run. Finally they reached a cabin. They ducked inside. They were filled with fear, and the brothers felt that leaving the cabin would end in their deaths. What they found in the cabin made them regret their ignorance and legends. For in the main bedroom of the cabin were corpses, at least a hundred of them. Every animal they had seen that night was there, along with some larger bodies, some human bodies. It was then that the man burst into the room, except he was once more a wolf. In his deep voice he snickered out, <laughs> Welcome home. The following week, the authorities found the cabin during their search for Jason and Alex. Both brothers' faces looked as if they were eaten by some sort of animal. Six days later, a security camera several states over caught Alex filling up a car with gas. Several eyewitnesses also reported seeing the dead man. And on nearly all accounts, he was smiling a wide, toothy, unnatural grin. Indian Skinwalker by Ray O'Bannon I like the desert at night. They say it's dangerous to be out here like this, but it's good to sit by a campfire and drink a beer. Out here where there isn't any noise or traffic. You can see all the stars because there aren't any electric lights to chase them away. Sometimes the wind sings to you. But then somebody usually comes along and messes it up somehow. Mostly it's drunks who want to beat you up because you're from the reservation. So when I heard pebbles shifting somewhere off to my left, the hairs on the back of my neck started to tingle. And my hand inched a little closer to my bowie knife. The figure that came walking out of the darkness didn't look very threatening. Just an old man, wearing traditional Navajo clothing and leaning on a crooked walking stick as he shuffled quietly towards me. Getting cold, came the old man's voice, dry as the desert. I expected him to say something more, but instead he just sat down across the campfire from me, laying the walking stick casually across his lap. There was something about him that made me uneasy, and my apprehension increased when his hand vanished into a leather pouch that hung on his belt. But he pulled forth only a scrumbled packet of cigarettes, holding them slightly towards me. Smoke? Sure, I replied as my nerves began to relax. When he tossed me the pack, I noticed there were only two cigarettes left inside. I took one and tossed the pack back to him. I held my chrome zippo out towards him, but instead he took a wooden match from behind his ear, scraping it against a small grey rock that dangled from the leather cord around his neck. A sudden flare of light illuminated his ancient weathered face, and his eyes seemed to sparkle eerily for a moment. Then he sat smoking silently. Dangerous out here at night, you know? He spoke softly after a while. Lots of things come out at night. Even things nobody believes in anymore. They still come around sometimes. I smiled a little. You mean ghosts and goblins? Maybe ghosts, he answered after considering in a moment. Not goblins, I don't think. Not even sure what a goblin is. 
There are other things, too. Things like the skinwalkers. You know about them. A sudden chill ran down the length of my spine as the old man studied me quietly. Mom used to tell me stories about them when I was little, I mumbled. And you know what can happen, said the old man. They take the shape of a man and wear the skin of a man. They're really more like an animal underneath. They have powers, too. Folks used to say only a shaman could defeat them. He turned his attention to the campfire. His image seemed to ripple behind the waves of rising heat. Embers danced around him like angry red fairies. Lots of other things out there, too, he continued. The Wendigo, the Chupacabra, all sorts of things. They don't come around much anymore, but sometimes they do. Silence settled over us like a damp woolen blanket. The campfire seemed to begrudge us what little heat it was providing. The stars twinkling above seemed to suddenly be laughing slightly, sharing some sinister joke amongst themselves. The thin slice of moon sank behind the lone cloud bank, as though unwilling to witness whatever might transpire. The beast attacked us without warning. I felt its claws sink into my back as a great weight fell upon me. Then it was gone and I rose up to see the old man falling backwards. Whatever was on top of him wasn't visible, but I could see jagged rips appearing in his clothing and in his flesh. Then suddenly he was thrusting the walking step upward, and there was a terrible screeching sound. The creature fell backwards into the fire and became visible as it writhed in the flames. I can't really describe it. Imagine a pale white maggot taller than a man, its bloated, mushy body bristling with claw-like barbs. Something like a mouth at one end, with rows of shark-like teeth lining the inside. A clump of black eyes that seemed completely lifeless as it rose from the fire and again hurled itself towards the old man. I'm not a hero. My brain was screaming for me to get out of there just to run, run anywhere, to just get away. But then I heard the old man's screams, and I saw the empty cigarette packet lying crumpled on the ground. And something inside me stopped shaking and started getting angry instead. I tore away my clothes, and I tore away my skin as well, revealing my true form. I was springing towards the ugly monstrosity before I really had any time to think about it, which is probably just as well. As I struggled with the creature, attacking savagely with my own teeth and claws, I caught a glimpse of the old man rising weakly to his feet. His walking stick was beginning to glow faintly, casting an eerie light upon him as he moved forwards. He plunged the stick deep into the creature's hide. The thing stopped biting at my face and made that deafening screeching sound again. But this time, it didn't stop screeching for a long time. I'm not sure if it died or just went to some place when it faded away from view. I hope it died. The old man reached down to recover his walking stick from where it had fallen, watching me carefully. It's difficult for me to speak when I'm in my true form, but I can manage if I concentrate. What was it? I managed to ask. No idea. He answered with a puzzled frown. We stood staring at each other for a moment. You can eat a new shirt. I pronounced quietly, pointing a talon on his torn and ruined clothing. It's nothing, he chuckled. You're gonna need new skin. But then his smile faded, his grip tightening on his walking stick as he studied me in the campfire's flickering light. You can relax, I lisped. Shaman skin won't work on me. His eyes drifted uncertainly to his walking stick. Still, I'm supposed to try to destroy you. Yep, same here, old man. We continued staring uneasily at each other for a long moment. Then the old man's smile slowly returned. Crazy world, ain't it? 
crazy world. I agreed. As he turned to go, I glanced around and saw the shredded remains of my jacket. Snagging it with a claw, I turned back towards the old man, shuffling away into the darkness. Hey, perhaps. I called quietly, tossing him the fresh pack of cigarettes that had been in my jacket pocket. I think I managed something like a human smile. He nodded thanks, and then vanished into the desert night. I sat back down besides the campfire. A million stars twinkled overhead. They say it's dangerous being out here alone in the desert. But I like it. Sometimes the wind sings to you. And all you can do is sing back. The following is an allegedly true story from an Australian 4chan user. As my Australian accent is terrible, I'll be using my own. Basically, my nope is that I think there is something living slash walking around in my ex-best friend's skin. We'll tell the tale and the notes that led up to it. July last year, me and my friends are both 18, decide to go camping for a week. End up not liking any of the lame, paid campsites. We're doing this the old-fashioned way, goddammit. Illegally camp in this amazing area surrounded by paddocks and woods and etc. Far away from houses and properties. Nearest town is at least half an hour drive away. Fuck snakes and spiders, we are Australian. First few days of camping are great, though it was pretty rainy. Every night we end up talking for hours and being hilarious and then going to sleep in a massive swag I bought. The place is great, but for some reason we stick together. It made me feel uneasy to be alone, and for some reason, we always made sure we were within viewing distance of one another. One night, we huddled up in fear. Can hear something walking around the fucking swag. Walks around us for hours whilst we both nope.jpg the fuck out. Hear fucked up screeching from the distance. Noise like wind going past really fast and footsteps stop. We're camped in a clearing, no wind can get through the trees like that. And it hasn't the whole time. My friend laughs. <laughs> Holy fuck, I know that was scary as fuck. Ended up eventually going to sleep, but wake up at noon. Next day, I'm cooking. Oh shit, we need more firewood. Can't leave this food because it'll burn really fast. My friend volunteers. Duh. First time one of us has gone into the wooded area alone. Friend pauses before going in. Finally summons some fucking courage and disappears from sight. I'm a fucking master chef. Not wearing my watch, but it's been like an hour. I'm nearly done cooking this stuff. Assume they're taking a shit. I'll give that fucker some privacy. Fire begins to fail, so I have to ninja get some wood and finish the meal. Eventually I realize maybe inbred fuckers have assaulted and eaten my friend. I mean, I spent ages cooking this meal. I'm willing to avenge at the risk of being assaulted and eaten myself. Grab big ass knife, rifle, torch, and a bite my delicious damper. Walk into the woods, yelling for friend. Feel something watching me. Beginning to get scared, but not about to admit that. Come out, you fucker, it doesn't take that long to shit. See someone in the woods in front of me. Hear my mate laugh. Hear screech behind me. Oh fuck no, .jpg. Sprint that shit straight towards where I saw my friend. A fucker is unarmed. Be running, lose sight of friend. Call out to him. Motherfucker, if you're dead, I'll kill you! End up breaking through wooded area into a paddock. Ah, shit, that JPEG. See something move in the woods across the paddock. Looks big. Bigger than me. Considers how many bullets I have. Probably not enough. Haha, <laughs> nope. Run back through the woods. Get through to campsite. My friend is sitting there wearing a change of clothes. <laughs> Holy fuck, ain't only it was scary as fuck. See, nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Stupid bitch, what did you do? Cover yourself in shit. He laughs. Oh, wait. Did you hear that screech? Shakes his head. Must be paranoid. We dig into some delicious food. Tell him about the huge thing I saw. He just laughs again. I wouldn't worry about it. That night, sitting cross from friend in front of fire, I decided to teach myself whittling. Whittling away. Cut my thumb. Friend looks at Thumb. Stick a band-aid on that shit and continue to whittle. 
He's reading a book and has a little lantern with him. I know, what a bitch thing to do. Woods rustling and shit. Crickets chirpy chirping away. Friend laughs at something he's reading. Now think about his laugh in the woods. Realize it's the exact same laugh as the one when the thing walked around the swag. Same laugh he did just then. Same as the first thing he said when I found him with different clothes on back at camp. He said the same words too. Hmm, weird. Eventually decide to drink a bit. He's a lightweight. We both crawl into the swag, giggling. I have a knife attached to my belt. Wake up once and find him staring at me. Drunk brain suddenly worried he might be going homo for a second whilst drunk. Talk about this girl I really like. He seems to be really aware and listening to everything I say. Suddenly feels like my bladder is going to burst. I stagger out to this little river that goes past our campsite. Take a piss in the early morning light whilst in the awe of the majesty of nature. See something grey sticking out of the riverbed. Pull it out. It's my friend's shirt he wore yesterday before going into the woods. It's torn up pretty bad. A little bit of blood on it. Too drunk to really put anything together. Lovingly rebury it because my drunk brain thinks putting the cotton back into nature to decompose is a great idea. Clean hands on pants. Climb back into swag. Friend is fucking gone to the world. I pass out and wake up a couple of hours later. Friend's still asleep. Dirty hands, but then again we both have dirty hands and stuff. Begin to nope about weird shit that was happening. Fire needs restarting. While pushing the coals and ashes around to add wood properly, I find a button off the pants he wore yesterday, and a bit of grey cotton fabric like the stuff on his shirt. What the fuck? Today is the day we pack up and leave. When friend wakes up, he's being weird as he was yesterday. I'm packing. He gives me a weird look. I tell him to help. He asks if I can go get some firewood because he's hungry. I tell the bitch once we're done packing, I'll hold his hand and go into the woods with him. Once we've packed up, we both carry shit up to the car, which is hidden up near the bush track to get out of here. I've checked my car every day. He follows the whole way because the dumb fuck has probably forgotten where it is. We load up the car. I turn to make sure it's all good. I'm able to tune the radio. Pretty staticky, but there's a weather warning about some storms hitting the area. We go back to the campsite to grab the last shit. Can we go get the firewood now? Friend is standing just inside the edge of the woods. Suddenly get this feeling deep in my stomach, like instinctual fear or something. Really want to get the fuck out of there. Nah man, weather warning. Eat some food we've got left over and we'll buy some hot food when we hit the next town. It's about an eight hour drive home. While I finish picking up rubbish, he doesn't even eat anything, but the fucker is still acting weird. Ask him if he's alright. Yeah, Anon, I'm fine. Are you sure we can't stay another night? I don't think the storm will hit here. I see something move in the woods behind him. What the fuck was that? He doesn't turn around. I pull out my knife and for some reason he almost goes into a defensive pose. Gives me a weird look. Dude, there was something behind you! He turns around then. I'm sure it was nothing, Anon. While we walk up to the car, he looks behind us a few times. And trying to act normal because he isn't. So, uh, when I was cleaning up the fire, I noticed bits of your clothes in there. He says he wrecked them whilst collecting firewood and didn't want to add to the rubbish to bring them back. Fucking weirdo, dude. You've never done shit like that before. He shrugs and looks around as we get to the car. I feel like something's watching me. Once we're in the car and back out on the road, I feel better. I keep trying to make conversation, but he doesn't put much into the conversation. I turn on the radio. Every so often, he repeats things some of the radio presenters say. While we aren't talking, I have time to think about it. Him not being worried about shit that worries me. Think about the weird looks he's been giving me in different situations. I feel sick and horrified, and I realize the faces are probably faces I was pulling at him at those moments. He's been mimicking my expressions. Realize he's been repeating phrases I say and his laugh never changes. His clothes all torn up and burying them. Wanting me to go back into the creepy fucking woods for some reason. 
I know for a fact he isn't gay or some shit. He has a girl he likes, and it's adorable how chill he tries to be about it. Decide to give it a little test. Talk about some stupid shit we did as kids. Ask him questions, and he just says, Oh, I don't remember that part. Or agrees with me. The more I think about it, I realize he hasn't been acting like himself at all since he went missing. When we get into town, I turn my phone on and call my mum. She's glad we had fun and stuff. Can't wait for us to get back into town and spend more time with her before I go back to work. FIFA for life! Ask him if he's going to call his parents. Weird look again. Then he gets his phone from his backpack. We'll continue, nearly done. I buy grab money from our joint cash fund and buy us both lunch. He eats the almost raw steak from his burger but doesn't want his chips and the rest of the bun or salad. He goes in. Comes out with two more huge pieces of red steak, done rare. Wolfs those fuckers down whilst I finish my meal. Pulls out his phone again and fires off some text. Notice some wicked bruises on his upper arms. What the fuck happened there, man? He shrugs, says they don't hurt. Well, okay then. I change clothes and shower there. He's waiting in the car. Notice him staring and watching other people. Says he doesn't want to shower. I call him a smelly fucker and so he disappears for a bit. Comes back with new clothes and has had a shower, thank Christ we both smell like wildlings. Keep on driving. Now night time. Only an hour or two away from home. He slowly begins to join in conversation, but he doesn't sound the same as he used to. None of his speech habits, like making puns, that's a fuck. No talking about the girl he's crazy about. Decide to bring up the creepy shit that happened outside the camp. I swear I thought about shooting that horse or whatever the big thing was, but then I decided I liked my chances of not knowing. He laughs. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, Enon. I begin to feel uneasy and think that maybe this isn't my friend sitting beside me anymore. What about that thing that walked around our tent? He gives me this weird smile. Maybe it was a werewolf, Enon. I laugh. Or a hot chick who was lost. He grins wider. Or maybe something just came to check us out. Feel weird again. I force a laugh. <laughs> Why would anything do that? Like some cannibal or rapist? He looks out the window. I can't watch him because I gotta keep my eye on the road. Maybe they wanted to get out of there as badly as you did this morning, Anon. What the fuck did he just say to JPEG? Glance at him. Not looking at me. Can feel my knife still on my hip in its holster. The rifle stored safely away in the bank. <laughs> like a skinwalker or some shit. Trying not to drive this fucking car off the side of the road. Something like that. We both go silent. He laughs. Same fucking laugh. But that would be impossible. Right, Anon? Yeah. Yeah, it would be. Radio goes on and we don't talk for the rest of it. Get to his house, help him get his shit out of the car, and then I drive home. Get inside. Shaking. I am a man, for fuck's sake. Keep it together, motherfucker. Seriously think my friend died out there and there's something else living inside him right now. Which it has happened like his dog and cat have mysteriously disappeared. He doesn't hang out with us as much. And even the girl he liked tried hanging out with him, and she says he was really fucking weird. He apparently acts almost robotically, and only eats hardly cooked meat like a fucking caveman. His mom even asked if he had gotten into any fights because his skin was always bruised. Now, he could have joined a fight club or has become the most clumsiest fucker ever, but honestly, my best friend is a total different guy. He recently invited me to go camping again to the same spot. I had to say it was busy, but I'm terrified that maybe there was more than one. And when he tried to get me to go out into the woods with him, he was trying to lure me out there for the same thing to happen to me. Shit's so fucked, I ignore his calls now, and whenever I get back from a swing at work, all I get is complaints about his weird behavior and people asking if he's on drugs or something. For God's sakes, I've told my friends to never take him up on camping, and I told the girl I liked, now my girlfriend, all this weird shit that happened, and she agrees that he is totally a different person. 
He was a stand-up guy who was hilarious and laid back, and now he's almost malicious and uncaring, and sometimes I can hear that fucking laugh in my head. That fucking screech. It sucks being terrified of someone I used to love like a brother. And so concludes the fucked up tale of me being convinced that my friend is no longer human, or who he used to be. I've never in my life seen anyone change like that. Just, some days I fucking nope the whole thing and hope I was just crazy and he'd gone on some sort of hardcore drugs. Should have asked him things only he would know. Lie about something. Make him agree with you. And there you go. A better way to tell. Or just come clean with everything and see if he admits it in arrogance. That's pretty much what I did. And that's what set it off for me. Stupid shit we did as kids, like putting this purple goo in these girls' hair. He loved to tell that story because in order to get rid of the blame on us, we put her in on hair so we wouldn't get in trouble. And they wouldn't tell. We got in trouble anyway. While we were driving, I asked him if he remembered putting goo into girls' hair. He said yes. I asked him if he remembered if it was green or purple or blue or something. And he said he didn't remember, but he was pretty sure it was green. Now there was no fucking way he forgot. No fucking way. He fucking told that story a couple of weeks before we went down there. I also asked him shit about his first dog, Mo. He didn't remember shit about Mo. In fact, it made me so fucking sick of his vague fucking responses that I stopped before I realized I was getting upset. And God knows what would have happened if it realized what I was doing. But I assume it can read, and it learns, very fast. Like his phone. When I told him to call his parents, he treated the phone like he had no fucking idea. But then by the time I bought food, he was already texting people. And then is mimicking my expressions and other people's and the radio's talking. It was fucking too spooky for me, man. Maybe it makes me an arsehole for being willing to drop a friendship that I've pretty much had my whole life over these experiences, but honestly, what am I supposed to do? Hello, officers. When I was on a camping trip last year with my best mate, we spent a good amount of time drinking and camping on illegal ground, which will get me fined if not imprisoned. I'm pretty sure something ate my friend's insides and is now wearing him like a meat suit. Could you please contact the proper authorities and have the entire town and said campsite nuked? <laughs> From what I know, he hasn't attacked anyone physically, nor asked anyone else to go camping with him. My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it, for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died, but honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talk about ghosts and aliens, and you think to yourself, that ain't real. They're making it up, or they've mistaken, or they're crazy or something like that. You just can't believe it. Until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father had told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rank. It's not what my father called it, of course. He never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after an old Cherokee tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story, the way he told me. We were out hunting one night, he'd tell me. Coyotes, 
We'd kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They'd lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes, while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. The landlord didn't mind, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and headed home, walking, because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods. That's when we came up on it. Blood everywhere, splattered on the trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first, we'd figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off the one that's weak or sick or old, or just small. They'll hunt it and draw it into a corner some place it can't get out of, and they'll run it right into the biggest one, the Alpha. And that deer will never see the Alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then drop dead. It's quick, it's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den. Wolves neither, because they get too much of a fight. There were three, I think. Three bodies. Just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg there, and a torso there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for the food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses and we think it's something we've got to take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him. And I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone. With nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife. He was only thirteen at the time, so... A point twenty-two rifle was about the only gun he could reliably use. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but we finally began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I had never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises. There have been a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world, and I ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. I heard deer, a fox, rabbits, raccoons and birds just scared. Keep in mind, this may be twelve or one o'clock, except the fox and some birds, nothing, were supposed to be even awake. But they weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw flocks of birds that night fly straight into trees, just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us. They ran right past us didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same thing. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple of wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together. That maybe, whatever we're tracking, it wasn't something we're supposed to see, and it wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go towards trouble, to fight. And knowing what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field, but it wasn't in season. 
so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then. A lot of animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land. But where that deer boat was, nothing had taken a single step. Like they were leaving it just for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds, but that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing around forty pounds wet nearly tore out my damp throat. Once. All that it means is that it's quick and hard to hit. So we followed the tracks, and it didn't take us long to find where it is. There's this schoolhouse that sits on top of a hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado, but nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there, sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was just some sick kid riding a high. But we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise. Screeching kind of loud. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech. Another was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart, or someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down and whispers. I gotta stay behind him, because we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, probably rabid. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting it until it don't move no more, and slit its throat. And if it gets to Dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off him. So he walks up, and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side, so I can see what it is. I wish to this day I didn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tearing off its flesh, and throwing what it doesn't nibble at aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over, and its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try and get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't never heard true silence like that before, and not after. But for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise which made it all louder when it turned around. It made the shrill cry and jumped on Dad. He got off a shot, I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. It was on him, tearing parts of him off. I started shooting it with the twenty-two point blank, but it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds and I started hitting it with the gun butt. But it wasn't budging. It didn't even register I was there. It started clawing at my dad, taking bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, his tit, and moves up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then it started digging in. Ripped off the bottom half of his jaw. Little bones and a tube in your neck. In his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened. But somehow my dad's knife ends up in the thing's shoulder. And my dad ends up on my back. I'm running. By God, I'm running faster than I've ever run before. Or thereafter. And it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite to the ones we'd been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house. But it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. 
I hear these tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like it's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often. But I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip onto gravel. I look up and there's the landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around the campfire. I scream and I cry and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance and he looks at me. And I'll never forget what he said. What's that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after his waist. Suddenly we hear it, screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown to the ground. I'm fighting him, crying because I still think we can save him somehow. My dad had been gone for a while, since I picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside, and they're locking doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me what happened. What happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous there. All the lights in the house are on, and someone calls the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and see it walk in front of the fire they'd made. Don't know what it is, one of them says. It looks like an ape. Suddenly something goes through the window. He shoots at it. But it ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog. Just the body, though. Not its head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the doors and windows. We hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass getting ripped apart. We put a couch and TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent like before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, except it was louder. And it didn't echo and fade out because it was inside. We all rushed to the door leading upstairs and we got to it just as the thing did. It opened it just a bit and four or five men just slammed into it. It just got its hand through. Some with a shotgun took care of that put the barrel right into its wrist and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand clean off. That only pissed it off though. It started pushing on the door, clawing. We were on the one side, pushing as best we could, and it was on the other, doing just the same. The wood just wasn't going to hold, so someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing, and the splinters are everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded on the top of the door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door. What was left of it? The sun was up before they got me off it. They put me in the hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job for the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much. Not about the thing. But I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how he could say that when they had the hand. He looks at me stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, died on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. 
The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. Never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if the whole goddamn US Army was at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I didn't think my father felt like he had anything left, and that he might as well settle old scores. He went to those woods. He never came back. FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they got a few calls about those woods every year. About someone up and vanishing. But that wasn't all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he wrote the rake onto a napkin. I didn't know what he meant until I searched it on the internet. Honestly, I would have rather not known. My grandfather saw a skinwalker. By Ronin Dock. My grandfather told me a story once, as we sat around the campfire in his backyard, in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear and each star twinkled in a purple sky, with the full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy and gravelly, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide dark eyes as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, I lived outside an Apache reservation, with your great-grandfather. He returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on hundred-acre ranch set between Bramby Mountainside with dirt good for growing thornbush, but not much else. One night, Mother was sick, and Pa and I took a trip to town, about fifty miles away, straight through the dry desert, over a washed-out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. The fire sparked, and the log cracked, jolting me out of the story. What next? I asked. Still down, boy. You'll hear soon enough. Pa and I were driving an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick, with only the lights of our old truck lining up the road. I remember, too, when the engine began to sputter, and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. God damn it, Pa said, getting the Ford to one side of the road as it coasted to a halt. Stay here, son, he said as he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down, and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Pa was getting water from the back to cool the engine, and that's when I smelled it. Rotten egg. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the middle of the desert. My nose also picked up on carrion, like one of them dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat and lay there, until the crows picked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too. The back of my neck felt itchy, and my face started to get hot. The wind stopped blowing and hung still and heavy, with the stink filling the cab. Pa? I called. Pa? Pa? No answer. My heart started beating and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. Boy, I tell you, I never felt like this. Not until Vietnam. Not until I saw a man dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my pa's door and I saw something bound across the road. Through both dim beams of light, 
across the partly open donned hood. Grandfather paused. He spit a fad wad of tobacco spin off to the side, and he looked pensively into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was cool, but I was sweating and clammy. Well, what happened? What happened about your father? What did you see? <sighs> a creature. He shook his head. You have to understand, there were legends. Old legends. Older than the rock cairns out in the valley. Older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, than the old Indian chiefs and their shamans. The Apache and Hope and Cherokee. And all them old tribes and first peoples, they told tales, old stories about dark Indian magic. And made deal with the old spirit of blood sacrifice to gain power. Old power. Enough to fight each other. And the Spaniards, and later the white men that came for their land and women. They called them... He paused. Grandfather took a deep breath and bodied forward into his tail, across the fire in the night sky, the desert, the creek, the moon, the sun, and the old mountains. He bodied forward. They call him skinwalkers, shape changers, old warriors resurrected as skinless men, all sinew and muscle walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote. But messed up, boy, long and malformed snouts, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven foot, even hunched over. They'd gut the old cowboys and the white riders. They'd run through bullets and sabers, part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack. Wily, too. They could change their voice to match the person you knew, or might know. Boy, that's what I saw. Big and fast, only for a second it ran across the road. Gray and mottled, muscle flexing under its legs, hooves clomping on the road, stringy muscle hunched shoulders, and it turned. It looked right into the camp, looked right into my eyes, and I swear him, boy, I swear it grinned at me. I sank into my seat in shock, in fear, shaking. I knew death was near. The air was electric. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before the lightning comes and blows a tree to smithereens. Charged full with power. I yelled for my pa, but no words came out, just dry squeaking. I was shaking as my grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I know he survived. But the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now, I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers is trickery. Sure, they could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legends say. Maybe an hour before the soul of the skin they wore would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Though I think getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime. One second in one thousand years. My father's door opened, and I jerked my head to the left, putting my fists up to fend off attack. Son, it's me, my father said before climbing into the cab. He grabbed the steering wheel and pulled himself in awkwardly, jerking himself into the seat. I cringed in the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Boy, your great-grandfather was a good man, treated me and my ma right. He fought Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all them camps. And now I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your ma, he said as he pulled the truck into gear, pulling out into the road to resume our trip. I guess it was him after all. But how did you know? 
Was it because he said something about your mother? No, boy. I knew because out the window, out the corner of my eye, I seen that beast running 50 miles an hour right next to the car, looking at me with them yellow eyes and grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next to his boy. My pa kept his eyes on the road, locked straight for it. Son, he said, don't look at it. Don't look at it. That's how I knew boy. So I got the chance to visit my old high school buddy Danny shortly after I graduated college. I was going to stay a few days with him and his new wife, Carolyn. So I packed a few days worth of clothes and drove to Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. I get there and it's hot as a motherfucker and just as humid. We say our hellos, introduces me to Carolyn, and we head inside to eat dinner. Carolyn seems nice, somewhat reserved but curious about me and my friendship with Danny as kids. She lets me and Danny do most of the talking, but asks some good questions to steer along the conversation. Lots of smiles, she was. After dinner, she and Danny cleaned up and I got to spend some time getting acquainted with their dog. Truman, he's small, shook all the time, and never shut the hell up. One of those yippy dogs that thinks it's bigger than everything else around it. It didn't bite, though, so I really didn't mind. Once the table was clear, Carolyn unleashed up Truman and took him out for a walk. Danny and I moved to the living room and caught up over the last few years. He had popped open a beer and was really enjoying the AC, as was I. We somewhat lost track of time, and Danny had noticed that it had grown dark out and Carolyn was usually back by now. He didn't seem too concerned, as sometimes she took Truman out the long way around the neighborhood. It's a small one and close to the edge of the state park, where there are a lot of hiking paths that lead off, some circle around and back into the street, so it's a good way to get a nice walk in. We keep talking, and I realize nearly an hour had passed since she left. Danny kept eyeing the time on his phone and finally picks it up to text her. Even on the long walk, she's usually not out this long. Just as he hits send, the front door opens. Truman shoots through the door. He didn't make a damn sound as he sulked straight onto the couch and didn't come out. I can't see out the door from where I'm sitting, but I caught a slight whiff of something foul. I can't really describe it, but it was strong enough to leave the taste of copper in my mouth. The smell went away just as quick as it had come, and slowly, Carolyn steps into the house. She was slow and shuffling. There was a slight hunch to her, like she was worn out. And damn did she look it. Her knees had a slight gait to them as she walked in, leaving the door open behind her. After a few paces, she stopped, still holding the leash and not turning to face either of us. Danny shot up after closing the door, went to Carolyn, asking if everything was fine. He slowly turned her to face him. She looked really woozy, like she was about to fall over. Her mouth worked open and shut a few times, like she was trying to find the right things to say, but nothing was coming out. Finally, she was able to wheeze out, fine, though it sounded anything but. Danny felt her forehead, then mumbled something about getting her some water and aspirin, and then left for the kitchen. It took me a moment for the creeping feelings to settle on me. It wasn't the smell or the awkward shuffling that did it. When I think back on it, I believe it was when I finally noticed that ever since she stepped through that damn door, she didn't blink once. Being all gentlemanly, I asked Carolyn if she wanted to sit down, and I offered to take the leash. I was a bit nervous, but not enough to not still feel helpful. As I reached down to gently take the leash from her, I realized something else. It could have been the half beer I had, or the fact that I had just finished driving eight hours to get here that day. But I could swear that her right arm was slightly longer than her left. By slightly, I mean by at least a few inches. It could have been the way she was slightly hunched over, or maybe her left arm was bent in such a way that I didn't notice. 
but the entire proportion just seemed off. Still not taking the tingling hint to get the fuck out of there, I asked if she did anything to hurt her arm. She slowly turned her head to regard me. Arm, she repeated, then twisted her head down to regard it, like she was just now noticing it was there. I shit you not when I say that her arm spasmed as she eyed it. Then, after a few cracks and pops, it seemed to shrink down to the right size. She then turned back to me for a moment and shuffled past me into the hallway bathroom, the door closing behind her. It was at this point that I noped right the fuck out into the kitchen, where Danny was just coming out. I grabbed him by the arm and pulled him back into the kitchen. I told him that I think something was very wrong with Carolyn, and explained what I just saw. He stood quiet for a few moments, listening to me, his eyes looking behind me to the living room. He finally said, I'll go back to check on her. She looks fine, though. He looked like he was trying to convince himself more than me. He went and knocked on the bathroom door before entering. The door was closed behind him, and for a few minutes, I could only hear his muffled voice. I was still creeped the fuck out, but stood my ground, waiting to see if I needed to shift into full flight or full fight mode. Not long after, the door opened, and Danny stepped out with Carolyn not far behind him. He smiled at me, and said, It looks like she just got overwhelmed by the heat. I'm going to go ahead and take her up to bed. I'll be back down in a minute. I then looked to Carolyn, who was holding the water bottle that Danny had brought her. It was half gone, so it seemed to click with me that she could have just been dehydrated. But Jesus, that arm, I, I just can't unsee that shit. He helped her upstairs, and as they were climbing, I thought I could hear Carolyn rasp out, Be back. I wanted to nope right back into my car and drive off, but that would instantly turn me into Mr. Shitty Friend, and social pressure finally won over instinctual fear. Frustrated, I sat down on the recliner and eyed Truman, still huddled under the couch. He hadn't made a single noise since getting home, and he looked scared shitless. I gently patted my knee to call him out, and he refused to budge. Well, fuck him, I tried. It was dark and quiet, and I didn't realize that I had calmed down enough to doze off. It took a really fucking weird sound from upstairs to wake me. It was quiet and muffled, but low enough to rumble my seat slightly. It was a repeated sound, and the only thing I can compare it to was a giant cat hawking a hairball. I'm not sure why I was stupid enough to do this. Probably the sense of duty among friends. But I got my ass out of that chair and slowly made my way upstairs. The guttural hawking noise didn't stop, and it was definitely coming from Danny and Carolyn's room. That foul stench was back and pretty damn potent. The combo of the smell and the noise was almost enough to empty my own guts. I reached the door, which was, of course, closed, and I was getting closer and closer to flipping the fuck out as I neared it. Why am I doing this? What the hell are you doing, dude? Get the fuck out, I thought to myself. But no, I didn't. Not for a few more minutes, anyway. I knocked on the door, hoping they were just doing some kind of kinky fucking that I didn't want to picture. The retching sound continued. I stood there, looking like an awkward dumbass for more than a minute before knocking again. This time asking... Is everything all right in there? More hawking and retching. The damn noise wasn't letting up. I steeled myself. In case my friend was in some real trouble, I wanted to know what to say to the cops when I called them. I reached for the doorknob and twisted it open. What I saw was all in the span of a few seconds before I registered enough to decide to nope straight the hell out of the house and drive away. It looked like Carolyn. Almost. The top half of her was really white, and her naked, swagging breasts inflated and deflated like respiratory masks. 
Not sure why my eyes caught sight of her breasts first. Probably because I'm a guy, fuck it if I know. What should have caught my attention first were the two monstrosities poking out of her shoulder blades. Like an extra set of arms or some shit. Only somewhat bony and jointed, like the limbs of a flesh-covered insect. They arced over her back, down onto her bed and in front of her. I then noticed her mouth. It was open wide, far wider than it should have been. Something was emerging from it, like a dark and wet sack of something. And her entire body was convulsing as the thing slid further out of her mouth. It was hanging over what I finally noticed was Danny. Her body was so wide that at first I didn't see him underneath her. Danny was quite dead. Or unconscious with a shit ton of blood loss. Red was everywhere. The bed, the walls, the floor, it was especially all over Carolyn, though I doubt much if any was hers. Without stopping whatever the fuck ritual she was doing over her husband, she looked up. This was when I noped downstairs, grabbed the keys on the counter, said fuck it to the bag of clothes I left upstairs, and drove the hell away. I'd like to say I called the police right then. I didn't. I drove for hours, constantly checking my rear view until I couldn't see straight, and then start to the next motel, bolted the doors, and slept with all the lights on. In the morning, I called the authorities and placed an anonymous tip to have them check Danny's address. It was a week after since returning home that I googled their names. A small article appeared on the local news site that stated that he and Carolyn were missing from their residence. No sign of forced entry or any blood or struggle. The only puzzle was that their cars were both left parked in the garage. I can still hear that retching, feel the vibration in my chest. It makes me glad that I never gave Danny my new address. She Wears My Skin by Paula In the first early moments of consciousness, Catherine Sterling believed that she was blind. As she stirred in the dark, she slowly realized that her eyes were being shielded by something. She rubbed her palms against the ocular deterrent, feeling its coarse texture. Bandages. Her face stung with pain as she slowly pulled the bandages down and away from her eyes, taking care to not remove them completely. Her eyes struggled to see, with her surroundings blurring in and out of focus with each passing second. When her eyes adjusted, she could make out where she was. She was sitting propped upright in a hospital bed. The darkness from the open window indicated it was sometime in the late night. The darkness itself, countered by a faint glow from the hallway. Weakly, she raised her left arm to her line of sight. It too was covered in bandages, with only the fingers protruding outwards. She strained her memory to remember how she ended up here, but everything in her mind came back blank. Oh, we didn't expect you to be up so soon. Catherine's desperate attempt at remembering was cut short by the sound of a female voice. The voice was concerned, and it sounded hauntingly familiar. Hearing it caused a slight pain in Catherine's head, but she ignored it. She turned her gaze to the woman, who was standing in the doorway. She wore a doctor's coat over the top of a light blue nurse's uniform, with gloved hands clutching a clipboard tight to her chest. She too looked familiar, but once again, she couldn't understand why. The woman entered the room, standing beside her bed. Catherine figured that this woman understood her situation far better than she, and she slowly spoke, her shallow breaths acting like winds for the bandages around her mouth. How did I get here? The woman sighed, placing her clipboard on the bedside table. You're recovered from Parker's hunting range. It was... an accident. You were lucky to be the only one who survived. But we still need you here for a while until you fully recover. The only survivor? I... 
I don't remember being at Parker's hunting range. I'm not sure why I'd ever go there. Who else was there? The woman pursed her lips. Two more bodies were recovered. Forensics are still working on one, but we identified the other as a man by the name of Douglas Gatherson. He were recovered not far from his body. I know it's a lot to ask at this time, but did that name ring any bells? It, it does. Douglas and I, we dated in high school. But I still don't understand why I... Suddenly, it felt as though a weight was lifted from her fatigued brain, as details began flooding into a stream of consciousness. Wait, Douglas has called me during my shift. There is something in the range he needed my help with. Who was that? A blank slate? Catherine paused. The phrase blank slate stirred something in her. It was a feeling unlike any other. The feeling of primal dread. The feeling that anyone or anything could strike from the darkness at any moment. The feeling that she was never truly safe. Blank slate. When the paramedics brought you in, you were barely clinging to consciousness. Honestly, I was afraid we would lose you. But just before you nodded out, you said something. You said the sentence, it was a blank slate, over and over again. I'm just as confused as you are about what it means. Catherine's breath stifled as she remembered. How could she have forgotten the blank slate? Her mind was besieged by vivid memories of the encounter. Douglas calling her over to the clearing in the woods. Seeing that thing, the blank slate, for the first time. Hearing the tear of mortal flesh as it ripped through Douglas as though he were paper. Feeling the tree branches claw her face as she ran mindlessly through the endless wood. The sound of snapping branches behind her never once letting up. She remembered the horrible groans that emanated from its featureless face. Sounding like a dying animal struggling for one final breath. That was the last thing she remembered before she awoke only minutes ago. In an instant, she jolted to life, leaning forward from her mounted position against the bedpost. She reached out for the woman who backed away concernedly. Listen! She began shakily, certain that this woman would never believe her. What I'm about to say is going to sound insane, but you have to believe me. This thing, this blank slate, it's dangerous. I I I'm not even sure what it even is. But it can duplicate people. It duplicated Douglas. But then he shot it, and it, it turned into- Whoa, 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 slow down. The woman said, raising her hands in a stopping motion. Take it easy. Start from the beginning and tell me everything. No matter how crazy it may be. Catherine took a deep breath before beginning. I got a call from my old boyfriend, Douglas. He said there was something down in the hunting range that he needed my help with. When I arrived, he was standing over this thing. It was completely featureless, and it was the palest shade of white I've ever seen. Douglas told me that when he first encountered this thing, it was the exact duplicate of him. It, it was even wearing the exact same clothes when I saw it. I did some examining, and I found out the thing was an organism made to absorb things. It absorbed blood samples to make itself look human, and it absorbed cloth samples to replicate the clothing that a certain person wore. With those requirements, it could replicate any person on Earth. B but after we figured this out, the thing was... It regained consciousness and ran away from us. It circled back and it... Oh God, it ripped Douglas to shreds. Then it chased me through the forest, and that's the last thing I remember. You have to believe me, all humans are at risk. If it got away after attacking me, then it's still out there, absorbing, and replicating, and killing the original, and blending into society, taking that person's place. Oh, Jesus.
She began to sob as the woman put her hands on her shoulder in a gesture of comfort. It's alright to cry. What you're experiencing is a form of post-traumatic stress. You and your friend were attacked by a wild animal. Since it's such a rare occurrence in that area of the woodland, your brain must have come up with another explanation for what happened to you. We here at St. Angelo's Hospital will do whatever we can to help you cope with the trauma, both physically and mentally. Y you don't believe me? The woman moved towards the cabinet, removing a needle with the words sedative inscribed across it. She then moved back towards Catherine's bed. I promise you, she said to Catherine, we're going to help you get through this trauma. Then you'll see things how they really happen. She lifted Catherine's arm, placing the needle in an open patch of skin in between two bandages, pushing the syringe all the way down. She watched as it dropped from 50cc all the way down to zero. Sweat began to form on her forehead as she looked down upon the needle to find that it was empty. The woman moved from the bedside and examined her clipboard. Your name is Catherine Sterling? What a coincidence. Catherine's heart began to beat faster. The woman's faint familiarity became a screaming warning in her skull. That's my name too. We have a surprising amount in common, Miss Sterling. It's almost as though we're identical. She clicked the lights off, flashing one last smile to Catherine as she gasped for air, her heart convulsing in her chest. She thrashed in her bed, her struggle for air becoming violent. With her dying breath, she stared deep into the eyes of the woman. No, into her own eyes. They were her eyes, but the thing that saw through them was cold and soulless. As life slipped away, Catherine Sterling uttered a silent prayer in her hospital bed. Not just for herself, but for all the doomed humans of Earth. A forest ranger for a large amount of dense wooded forest just north of the U.S. border. 1200. Just signed on to shift. Get a call on the radio for 1049. Missing person in my area. Last seen wearing a sweatshirt, hiking shorts, and a red backpack. Missing for two days now and just reported. Mount up. Fuel up. Then head out into the area it was last known to be in. Cruising for about an hour and a half. Decided it would be a good idea to start out on foot. As it won't be on any service roads. Notify dispatch to send an additional unit. Wait for half an hour until backup arrives. He's a good guy I enjoy working with. We head up onto the trail that's known for getting people lost. As halfway up it splits and goes further into the woods instead of curving around and heading back out towards the service area. Hiking for an hour. Calling out the person's name, keeping an eye out for clues, etc. I wind around the bend to find small remnants of a campsite. Shout out for my partner and the missing gentleman. Partner doesn't come around the corner. Uh... Go back around the corner. Partner isn't there. Come up on the radio. Anon? Anon? Come in. Officer Anon, are you code four? Nothing. Well, fuck. Inspect the campsite. It's fairly recent. About a week. But no new footprints or indents in the mud surrounding the fire pit, except animals. Decide to wait for partner. He may have gotten lost. Try the radio again. Officer Anon? This is Anon. Come in. Are you code four? Looking around in the trees, listening for any sounds out of the ordinary. Wait for 45 minutes for partner, while walking in little circles around the campsite. Partner doesn't show up. Now I'm a little worried. Go back around the bend in the trail, past a little rock outcropping. Head back the way we came and looking for any sign of him. As I come up onto a hill, I hear footsteps up ahead of me. Boots on the rocky path. Come up on the radio again. Officer Anon, are you code four? Still nothing on the radio. Dart up ahead to get a good look at whoever's on the trail. Spot a red backpack on the guy. He seems to be walking a little funny. No swings to his arms. Walking almost like a robot. 
Excuse me, sir. What's your name? I'm 20 feet behind him by this point. Sir? He's still walking like a robot. Hey! He stops. He turns around, lightning fast. Are you Herbson McDerpson? He just stares at me. Are you Herbson McDerp, sir? He still doesn't speak, but nods his head. We've been looking for you. Let's head back to the trailhead. After about 40 minutes, we reach the trailhead. And my and my partner's vehicles are still there. Now I'm going to put you in the back of my truck. You're not under arrest. Just so you can relax and catch your breath. Try the radio again. Anon, are you out there? Anon! The radio crackles alive. This is Officer Anon. Yeah, I'm okay. I found the missing person. He's got a broken leg after falling off a small cliff. I patched him up. I'm running our way back to the trailhead. Sorry for not responding. I was out of range. Got separated at one of the trail forks. Uh, what? And on, I've got the missing hiker. He's in the back of my truck right now. Silence for two minutes. Anon, lock your truck and grab the 12 gauge from my Jeep. Why? Just do it and don't let it out of your sight. Okay. Unlock his Jeep, grab the 12 gauge and inspect it to see if there's a round in the chamber. Calmly walk over to the truck and peek into the window. Nobody's in the truck. And the cage was bent to a severe angle, with my driver's side door open. Oh, shit. Swing around the other side of my truck and peer into the cab. Nothing. Close the door and climb into the bed. Sitting on the roof for an hour and half shit in my pants in terror until my partner got back with the injured hiker. He looks at me. You let it get away? What do you mean by it, Anon? I'll tell you later. Never did tell me when we got back to the station. Don't know if it was a skinwalker, changeling, or what. But it was definitely noteworthy. I'm back. Talked to my partner today as we're both on the same service road and assigned to the same area. I asked him about the odd incident a month ago. Pulled him next to his jeep. He was filling out paperwork. Hey Anon, how's the shift so far? Yeah, a couple of idiot kids decided to drink out here. Some people having sex. Nothing too serious. So, about that incident a couple months ago, I've been trying to figure it out, and it just keeps confusing me. You never exactly told me what it was, or why you had me lock my truck and get a shotgun. He clicks his pen and puts it in his back pocket, closing the citation. Well, it's not something you need to know about. It would be in your best interest to keep your nose clean of it from now on. Come on, don't scare me with that G-Man secret agent bullshit. Just explain what you thought it was. He looks at me from just below the ball cap. It's something that's lived here long before I ever took this job. I used to live in this area. And at night, I would always hear my neighbor's voices calling my name. Or my family dog barking when the dog was on my bed. Now I'm interested. Dispatch interrupts us with a call about kids shooting animals. Then another call about someone breaking their leg... Then patrolling campgrounds and hiking trails. So that's all I got from him today. As we weren't near each other for much of the day. But I'll keep pestering him, X. I've never told this story to anyone. And I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today. And this thread has kept me good company. As I've drifted in and out. I don't really like talking about this time in my life, but I want to contribute. When I was 10 or 12, I lived with my mother. We were below poverty level poor. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mother had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay up there. Our trailer was very small, and right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with the other animals deer and things very common in the area. Also inside the fenced area was a single room. It was built like a tiny house, but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had electricity, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. I was super into video games. I'm going to take on a random name so I can be easily identified in this thread. There's one thing you should know right now. 
This small fenced area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was heavily forested. Also, I refused to leave the fenced area, because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very... sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't movable though. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. That said, tiny bit of the property, there was no one else around for miles and miles. Now, I tell you all this because I think it is important you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. We have a fenced-in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mum's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced area, and a single unpaved road runs from the garden for about a mile until the main road. Now then, I brought friends up here to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know? Like camping out, sort of. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in, to play video games in all night long. It was like a dream come true. The downside was simple. When it got dark out, it got really dark out. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Odd things happen out there from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away, though. Noises like people working at night sometimes, or once me and my friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear round up a tree. But the tree didn't shake like there was a weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but, you know, angry dog. I was a kid. It happens. Now, I am a scaredy cat. I always have been. To be honest, I don't know why I even come to X. I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm all alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing. Just the kinds of people I get along with. This time I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles on my Sega Genesis on a ratty old television. We started playing as the sun went down, and by the time we were finishing the game, it was about 2am. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game, getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something heavy around. We hadn't heard it before, because the noise from what we were playing was loud. Immediately, I had goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house or yard right over there. It was forest for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging or rolling something really big. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turn the volume down so we can hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice the noise stop because I was getting engrossed. A couple of hours later, Jacob said he would use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I felt fine when he left to use the trailer to relieve himself. It was taking a while, so eventually I decided I was going to check up on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack whilst I was at it. I opened the door to leave, and he was just standing right in the doorway. Right outside the door. Facing it. Scared the shit out of me. I asked him what he was doing, and he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room, but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear him. He refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, but it was not unlike him to try and scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself partially because I knew my mother was asleep in there. I told him what I was doing, then moved past him. When I pushed him out of the way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he'd been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. He followed me, like right on my tail. It was unnerving. 
I joked a little, seeing that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke's already over. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow, just stayed at the doorway. I checked on my mum. He was fast asleep, then turned to go to the bathroom. Now, it being a porta potty, we just kept the bathroom door shut because, well, it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it, it's locked. A nervous voice came in behind the door. Ah, oh, I'm in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but a pitch black night. I freeze in terror. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come behind me and gone that way. There was no way to do it quietly. It creaks like a motherfucker. I yelled so loud that my mom woke up startled. I stared at the doorway, unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over to there, and looked down, not seeing anything. She closes the door and asks me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but a bit confused. I explained what had happened. Jacob said he was just taking long in the bathroom, basically. Neither of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mum's sure I just got sleepy and imagined it. Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mum gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room, tells us to go to sleep, then leaves us to go back to bed herself. Now this room doesn't have any windows or anything, so after a while I calm back down a little, and I tell myself that my mum was right. I must have had like a walking dream or something. Jacob insists he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him because there was no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down. I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking I can just sleep it off through the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I felt like I jumped so high I was surprised I didn't hit the roof. Jacob's laughing at me like, ha, huh, dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time now. Suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small scratching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be as silent as we can. Eventually it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He insists he's going to get my mother up, tell her something crazy is going on and we're going to go from there, with some kind of divine adult protection, no doubt. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there is no way I'm going out there. Never ever. He arms himself as best he can, with the tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple of deep breaths and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds later, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking as pale as a ghost. He keeps breathing like he'd just run a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I ask him what's going on like four times before he starts getting his words out. He tells me he walked out there, and as he was walking through the garden as quick as he could, he saw my mum, just standing there. He tried to talk to her, but she stared down at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what had happened earlier, he took a couple more steps towards her, telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned into an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed it sooner because of the darkness and how much of a hurry he was in. She was on the other side of the fence. Now the door to this room does not lock, and as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. He had been trying to move stuff in front of the door as he told the story, and by the end of it I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to be adverse to actually entering the room or the trailer, because the Jacob one couldn't come in either time it could have. This room was not sturdy. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow that, like cartoons, this would totally, definitely keep the creature out. For the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I cried. 
Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one time I thought I heard it speak, too. I heard it from right next to where I was resting my head against the wall. In my mother's voice, quietly, the same exact phrasing and intonation she had used earlier in the night. What's wrong? Followed immediately by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching eventually stopped. We heard my mum come to get us, this time actually hearing footsteps. We absolutely refused to leave the room. My mum had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and eventually moved away. But that night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night, unless I'm with a bunch of people, and will never ever live in the woods again. Anyway, hope you all enjoyed hearing about this. If you want to make an image and repost it, feel free. I probably won't tell this again though. Thanks for listening.